What is going on? It's Jay Campbell. Of course, I don't even know what I am anymore, but I'm today the host of the Decoder's Truth podcast. And I'm here with my good friend, my ex-podcast partner from way back in the day, Matthew LaCroix. Matt, how are you, man? It's great, Jay. I, I, I love sitting down and having these deep discussions with you. It's great to uh, recap and reconnect after all this time. It is, man. It's awesome. And, and let me just say real quick, first off, Matthew wrote his newest book in his first book, which was Suppression of Us, which is over in my bookcase, which I read you know, years ago, which is also an amazing book. Um, but this is his newest book, The Stage of Time. And I read this, as Matthew knows, um, why I was in Peru. And um, it really moved me. And it led me to some other books and some other people and stuff like that. But I had to have uh, Matt on the podcast to discuss his book because, guys, honestly, it was – you know, it took him three years to write it. It, in my opinion, is one of the best decodings in really of, of all time. I mean, and, and that's a massive, you know, credit to Matt. And, you know, he probably is like, dude, I don't know. You know, it's not the atrahasis. But honestly, he really put his mind and his heart into this work. What's going on in your life right now? You know, talk about like all the amazing stuff that's happening to you right now. Thanks for those kind words, Jay. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Along with those topics that we're going to be covering in the book, we have some really um, exciting stuff too. Some new discoveries that have been made in, re in, in uh, ancient history recently. We're going to talk about actually in the United States. Um, but I've been, I've been great. I've been extremely busy. Um, I wanted to give an, uh, a little bit of news for those, for so many people who have been asking, who have been interested, because um, in this paradigm we're in now where things are not quite the same they, way that they used to be. Not everybody's reading, not everybody has time to read. So a lot of people have been asking me about an audio version. And so I've been working really hard to do the audible version that'll be available at some point, but I'm not done and it's gonna take some time. So I just wanted to let everyone know that that's something that I'm working on pretty hard. Um, but other than that, I've been, I've been really enjoying doing some, uh, some little tinkering, some updates to get that perfect. Because like Jay said, this is a, um, this is a book that, is really my heart and soul, um, but more than that, it's about protecting these ancient texts so that, that the information they contain and the evidence that is being uncovered around the world can be known by people rather than just disappearing and, and um, turning into some myth. This is a next level book. Um, anyone in the esoteric slash research community, the awareness community, whatever we call ourselves these days, this is a must read book, man. It really, really is. Okay, well, Jay, thank you so much for those kind words. That's uh, really above and beyond. I really appreciate it. Um, and I, uh, anyone who's interested, check out thestageoftime.com. But so today, um, Jay and I are going to get into some of these deep topics that are covered in the book and some of these new discoveries being made and some of these mysteries that we still are considering and, and thinking about around the world that still have, are still someone consider largely unanswered, right? Absolutely. Just blasting it out as I do on social media right now. But yeah, so let's just jump in right now, dude. Um, we're going to try to make this as fast as we possibly can. For those of you guys watching on YouTube, um, if Matt has enough time and he's not too tired, and depending on how long this goes, we may answer a couple of questions. He's going to edit this um, on, for his channel, which is much bigger than the Coders of Truth channel. So for sure, um, let's get into it, brother. So free will and the nature of reality, Okay. Uh, and again, we may not flow exactly as Matthew's talking points are. And I always, as I always do, I want these guys to leave their talking points in the, in the message. But uh, let's just talk a little about that, you know, set the stage. Well, that's a great way you ended that sentence, actually. That's why I call the book The Stage of Time, because this exactly. really is a stage of physical reality that we're existing in, in this mortal body. Um, yeah. You know, and I, and I talk about that a lot, but it's just, it's a very important point to really get across is that like Jay knows all of these esoteric and mystery schools and all of these secret societies, they all taught the exact same thing. They simply taught that this body that we have in front of us is just this organic vessel to, to house our consciousness and that, that the, the whole purpose behind it is so that we can experience a physical reality where there are actual physical issues that come up when you make decisions rather than having potentially a decision maybe not have an impact on you because you're not a mortal being that can die or have someone else become angry at you for something you did and affects them in a negative way and so we we exist in 
this reality that in, in many ways, everything you look around you, everything is, that's told to you in school and everything that's projected, it, for the most part, I will say like over the last 10 years that that's been changing. But for the most part, we're, most, we're told that we're just these, you know, more primitive, like, like almost a more advanced primate who has reached this point only because of survival of the fittest and that because we're here, we're taking whatever we can and, and, and allowing materialism to consume us in this physical world because we're told that everything is about the physical world. Everything is about right. accumulating wealth and accumulating money and what can you accomplish in this, in this great feat. You know, and, and you're someone that is a very interesting example from both sides because you're someone who's both has, and I would, I would say has, has mastered their physical body to the point where you've tuned it to the, like a fine-tuned machine. But at the same time, you haven't fallen, fallen down that long road where you became obsessed with the physical body where you didn't right. acknowledge that consciousness exists at all. That, oh, this right. is my physical body. I'm, I'm a big, strong guy. And, oh, there's not, that has nothing to do with this spiritual, right. you know, all this stuff. You know, that's just silly. Right. So you're a very interesting right. example, in my, in my opinion, where you towed both lines, where right. you found the balance between both getting that physical tuning and then both that conscious tuning. And I think that's the whole right. point of this is that here I, we I, find I agree. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me ask, let me ask you something relative to that. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the ancient Greeks talked a lot about, you know, mastering the spiritual aspect of consciousness. You know, the, 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 Aristotle, the Aristotle statement was a sound mind builds a sound body. So it's like the inverse, it's back and forth. So they did understand that. But something I wanted to ask you about that is it probably stands to reason that Thoth, Toth, Thoth, whatever you pronounce, however you, you know, and the ancient, you know, these Atlantean priest um, leaders, kings, whatever you want to call them, Anunnaki, you know, descendants, whatever, whom, whom and whatever they were. We are finding out, Matt, now that there were massive, it's not even, dis, you can't discount it anymore that there were massive races of beings of, you know, 10 foot, 15 foot, 25 foot, 30 foot, whatever they were. And you would assume that these beings knew about the physicality and the spirituality and how you had to have both. So, you know, in what you're saying, it probably who I am is probably just a reflection of what it was the standard in earlier times. Yeah. Um, and I think you are right about that is, is we do have a lot of evidence that um, from a lot of places people wouldn't expect that some of these past kings and, and in, in our ancient history, even before the before the Romans, that there were um, what we would think of as giants or very right. large humans. That, as well as if we can get into some of those other influences as well. But sure, um, I want to. I, I guess I'll bring up to the point of that is um, it's pretty amazing to learn that something like um, the famous uh, seafarer explorer Magellan. Um, he pr probably the most famous example in history of um, someone who's well known having a controversial discovery like that, that then gets completely suppressed and that no one ever heard yeah, of hears course. about it. And so when Magellan, of course, if you go, go look at this, it's absolutely fascinating because when Magellan was sailing around uh, Patagonia and he went through what is now called the Straits of Magellan, his, um, they ended up stopping and to go get supplies and get water and things like that. And they went inland and his men um, found these, what they, they called giant men inland that were over, some of them were over 10 feet tall and they actually right. fiercely attacked them. And so Magellan and all of his crew had to rush back and then leave. <laughs> so they write all this down in their notes about this, the trip and they go back and they tell them. And then before long, no one ever hears about the story ever again. But I find right. that amazing considering that the same thing happened with Plato when he was talking in the Timaeus and right. about Atlantis. So like, for instance, one aspect of Magellan we keep where he's circumnavigating the world and that's what he's known about, but then it gets completely ignored about this discovery right. and what happened to Patagonia. And then with Plato, we use him as one of the greatest, considered one of the greatest philosophers in history. And yet we ignore this huge, enormous section where he talks about ancient um, Egyptian wisdom that he got from Solon right. and all these ancient right. kings from before him. And so it's, um, uh, it, it's this long connected rabbit hole of, here we have this information about our past and about how all these things have changed over time. And we've gotten to this point where it's just such a strange reality where people don't even think any of it's real. And they would laugh at right. the idea that any of these things could have been possible in the past. And I, and I think it's, 
it's very funny how closed minded people are, um, especially when you consider the fact that whenever new discoveries are made throughout history that change the paradigm, they're always, they're always initially mocked and, and, and ridiculed right. by most people. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, like a lot of the things that we do, you know, cause like in my, you know, health optimization world, you know, it's so far out in advance of quote unquote medicine or sick care or whatever you want to call it, you know, that's the status quo. It's the same thing. So, you know, whenever you're on the bleeding edge or the tip of the spear, this is just the walk. This is the route that we walk, right? The path that we traverse. It just is what it is. But I do believe, and you, you know, you were telling me this three or four years ago when you and I first started talking that the light was going to win. And it was always a little harder for me three or four years ago to see that when I looked around and I saw how fast technology was accelerating, the transhumanism movement, all these other things. But I, I'm a firm, firm, and I won't even say believe, right? Knower now that just as the dark is expanding their influence through technology, the light, the children of the light, people like us, people of awareness and consciousness are also accelerating probably at a rate, if not more advanced and similar. So wherever it's going to go, it's going to end up well. But again, as you know, through quantum physics, and you write a lot about this in the book, um, we manifest the destiny or the reality that we choose to. And we all, yeah. each of us have that power. And that's a great point. And, and we're still staying on the topic of understanding free will and the nature of reality. Those two, yeah. those two topics really answer that question and really get into it perfectly because we have two things going on here right now. One, we've been made to believe that, again, we're just this advanced ape and that consciousness doesn't exist. It's just created by the brain and, and, and that's how we perceive ourselves. So therefore, because we don't un understand how important we are and how we can actually create our own reality with our, with our thoughts, but more of on, like on, a, on a collective basis, not where you say, oh, I just want to fly so I can fly. It, it, it's not really like that, but it comes down to these deep levels of understanding that we can manifest certain aspects of our reality. And on a collective level, it, it gets more and more powerful the more souls that you have included in that. So therefore, if human beings here are actually the ones that are allowing and manifesting this reality to happen, it tells you, it really shows you that that's the whole point of why so many fear tactics and so many distractions and certain, so many different certain means of keeping our mindset in a certain way have been done because therefore when we, you know, watch TV and we see all these ads for going to buy stuff at the store and all these violent things that then show us all those things are then incorporating to how we manifest to create this reality and what we allow here. And so therefore um, this, this reality that we find ourselves in, we have free will, but because of the way that everything's been designed here and everything's been perfectly pushed to the fact that, we're in this state where we're be always being constantly forced to be conformed and to have this, this same linear thought process, thought process as all, all those around us. And so when you and I, those like us, start to go on this other side of looking into this forbidden knowledge, we often get shunned by most of, of the community. And I think that that's the biggest factor which leads a lot of people away from this path is that it's very lonely at times if you don't know how right. to find others like you. And it, it can be very depressing if you don't know which way to go. And so a lot of people will just give up and they'll fall back on their old ways. But we can't get past the idea that all of these things in front of us we see are merely just illusions. Getting no. back into ancient Egyptian wisdom, we have to understand that they considered consciousness and the soul to be the, the entirety of th that individual. Whereas, and right. like I said, this body is just a vessel. And so they, yeah. they had certain terms they, they called it. They called the body ka, and they called the mind right. and the spirit, spirituality ba. And so they talked about how these two forces of energy, which I think in many ways can be equated in, in, to the eagle and the serpent as well, where the eagle would be this conqueror of the physical world, and whereas the serpent would be this wisdom bringer and, and the, the spiritual right. the spiritual side. And that's why those two have been at such a clash because there are some individuals that have very focused. Um, they're, they're very determined to have a certain outcome win over here. Um, we've called those individuals many names throughout history, but that's what this whole battle has been about. When you look, and I just want to say, when you look at something like, um, you know, the great Roman empire and the Byzantine Eagle 
and, and the significance right. of that eagle and how in, in when the Romans, where they would have an army where they invaded some area. That's, th- this is the obsession and importance of these symbols. If right. that's that eagle that they had, which was called an Aguila, Aguila, it was the eagle that they had in front when they, when they would storm into battle, sort of like a flag. If that Aguila, Aguila was lost, they would literally send in hundreds, if not more, soldiers at any expense to get that back because these ancient cultures were obsessed with the significance of these symbols. And I, and I believe and I've showed evidence that the influences of that same symbol of the Byzantine eagle can be seen in the corruption in something like the Freemasons and how right. if you look at the 33 degree Freemasons, like and you look right. at the pictures of Albert Pike and others, they have the Byzantine eagle on those flags. And so you get right. to see that there is then this secret battle throughout history with these certain sides, with these two symbols and how they would, they would control how we perceive reality here and how our, our future would be basically. Right. Well, let me ask you regarding that, um, you know, cause you're for, for, for I mean, most people who watch us right now understand what we're talking about, but for the lay people who may be watching this, you know, on Twitter or other places that we don't, you and I have never broadcasted before, um, do you want to kind of define the serpent um, versus the eagle? You know, and again, from your decoding, and I know you know it very well. I mean, obviously you, Gerald Clark, and I have been studying this kind of stuff and reading all these ancient texts for so long and stuff like that. But why don't you just, just real quick, high level, hundred thousand foot summary, define the forces. Uh, and you can't really say good and bad, right? Or light and dark, because we live in a world of duality. And oftentimes the light, you know, if you think of the Kabbalion and you, th- you feel of the, think of the hermetic principles, um, you have the pendulum is always swinging. So the pendulum can go from good to bad or dark to light at times. And so it's very difficult for us as human beings with three dimensional classifications, especially intellect, to really see things from a higher dimensional perspective, which is that outside of our laws of physics in this three dimensional realm, there is no quote unquote light and dark or good or bad or even time. It's all kind of staged in a linear fashion for our puny three dimensional brains you know, to understand everything. So why don't you just kind of define, you know, who these sides are and how they kind of switch back and forth when necessary. Okay, this, is, this will lead really well into talking about early human origins, I think, too. Sure. Um, so what this really gets down to is we're going to discuss a lot of the evidence that is very, um, in my opinion, very strong and credible towards disproving the current theory we have on, on human origins and evolution and where we come from. And, and some people might think that's strange. What does that have to do with the eagle and the serpent? Well, human beings are not simply just a byproduct of an ape. We are a right. being that's been specifically designed for Earth. Okay? And I know right. some people might, I'm probably going to, I'll lose some people. That, that's, that's crazy. That's insane. No, I don't but think you will. If you, if, but if you Continue. look at it, look, look down close, get beyond what we've been told, and, and go look at some of these esoteric um, ancient texts. Go look at what these ancients talked about. And what did they talk about? Well, they said that human beings are based on these, these different vibrational frequencies that are composed basically of light. We are like a light being because every time we can raise our vibrational frequency to a higher level, we as- essentially unlock this new side of ourselves that will make us more advanced and more, and more aware all the time. Sounds like some, some kind of a you know, some kind of a movie or some strange thing out of a game, but it, but it's honestly true is that here we are, we're these organic beings that have this incredible power of consciousness where yes. if we're, if we're motiv- motivated enough and we want to reach a state where we're healthy and we're getting out and we're, we're not, we're disconnected from this concrete jungle world that we exist in where cities help really disconnect us from the universe and this, in this planet that we exist all around us. When we can, um, remove all those those distractions and get back into understanding here we are i'm in this body with higher consciousness and i'm learning all of these lessons that come along i'm growing as an individual all the time because i'm i'm becoming more aware i'm seeing all these things are being wrong when you do that you start to change on a fundamental level very quickly and a lot of people don't even understand what that is because it's not right. necessarily going they're not necessarily going through it but what what is going on in that individual is that all of a sudden, they're at this point where instead of being scattered, 
just this scattered energy where they sort of just go about and one thing throughout the day pulls them this way, one thing pulls them this way, and they're sort of floating along and they, they do whatever they're, that comes along the way. Instead of that, the, the, the highly conscious new individual, this person that's make it, made a, a determination and a judgment every morning, they say, what do I want to do today? What am I doing that I'm becoming, I'm not aware of, you know, how are my actions affecting others? How are they affecting my growth? You know, maybe I shouldn't have eaten all that junk food. Now I feel terrible and I can't right. sit down and, and read this book or go out for a hike. All these things start to incorporate. And before you know it, the individual starts putting all these things into place and they start advancing at a very quick level. When you see that, you, you immediately can tell one thing that that's a design that's been created as this path to reach a higher state. If we were in this state as just an evolutionary state in a completely in a, a by accident way, it would take tremendous amount of time to have these, sm these, these really big changes happen because that's what evolution would be all about, right? It would take thousands of years for this individual to slowly change and then here you go. Whereas in, in, our, in our reality, someone, if they had the determination and the, and the, the wisdom that's provided in the motivation, they can com completely change on an energetic level in one lifetime. In one lifetime alone, they can go from maybe being someone you would consider they would end up in a sewer drain somewhere without a job, homeless, or in jail, to being like some figure of, you know, destiny of, of light, providing knowledge to all kinds of people. It's all about free will, and it's all about duality. Right. And so make a long story short, getting back into the human origins and the eagle and the serpent, we're here to make whatever decisions we want to based on how we perceive our reality. So because of that, there was two sides that basically became represent, representative of duality, and that became the eagle and the serpent. And the eagle in many ways, even though the, the ways you can define that symbol can go very, very deep, on a high level, like I said, it can represent this this masculine linear control over the material world, a very uh, a power oriented um, control over, over um, conquering and, and destiny. Whereas the serpent, and, and this is the, these are the backward me meanings that we've been told because of especially the biblical references that have been given. But the serpent has always, since the very beginning of these ancient cultures, has represented knowledge, wisdom, and balance in this spiritual right. side of us. So you have one side, duality, with the seesaw effect. One is this materialistic world with the illusion and control and power. And the other one is this world of spirituality and connecting to this higher self and shedding these, this old side of us to then grow and, and, and raise ourselves. And so these two sides are not just this symbolic thing that we're wrestling with on an eternal level, but there actually have been these ancient, what we, we considered gods, these ancient, uh, Prometheus-like figures who have who have led to this creation of humanity and this design behind these chakras, like I'm talking about, this entire thing that we find ourselves in, all these rules and laws, everything we see around us, it's a byproduct of what happened in the past. And so, by studying them and seeing the struggle that's been going on, and I and I just I want to mention what that is really quick is that yeah, please. When we think of these, these gods and these two sides of one created mankind, which is what all the ancient tablets talk about. And the other side was this jealous side who never felt that humans deserved all these divine gifts in the first place. Okay. And you can either look at it from a cuneiform side. You can look at it from um, an ancient Indus Valley civilization side, or you can look at it from um, all the way getting into a Gnostic side, which is like ancient Egyptian right. wisdom. They're all essentially the same thing. And they're looking at right. the, the idea that we're, we're constantly being governed by these forces that are pulling and pushing in different directions because they right. essentially are these rulers of our reality. Right. And that, of course, we get, we'll get down to a long rabbit hole later on in the show. But these, these okay. rulers, essentially, they, uh, they adopted these certain symbols to represent themselves by and represent how the roles that they would play here by. And so those mentalities and all the different individuals and demigods and children that they had below them, they were all part of playing those roles. They all assumed and took on those roles and used those symbols. That's why all those ancient cultures in the Americas and across the world that had this ancient serpent um, dragon wisdom, like we find everywhere, it was essentially defeated and destroyed. 
which is really right. So let me ask, let, let me ask you a question. And that was a very, very good, elaborate explanation. Very elaborate. But I'm going to dumb it down. I want to dumb it down a little bit further so people can. And again, I know that we're defining things from a linear standpoint. But I think for most people, that's all we got, right? We're not, we're not fifth and sixth D and seven D uh, beings like some of these quote unquote godlike, you know, higher dimensional beings. And so we have to understand from a three dimensional perspective, which is, you know, why I'm going to try to break it down a little bit further. But in your opinion, and you have a very, very professional, well researched opinion, how far back from us understanding our time as of now, again, linear time, do you believe that these quote unquote gods? first showed up and before you answer that have they always been here we've just had so many epics of human you know uh civilization right we know we had floods we know we had the younger dryas event you know that graham hancock is decoded we you know we probably had other extinction level events in our past in your opinion when did these quote-unquote gods and i'll just refer to them as the anunnaki obviously that comes from you know both with Babylonian, Sumerian, Akkadian, and then of course yeah. the Atrahasis. Atra I mean, there's a lot of these ancient texts, but when do you think they first showed up timeline wise? Uh, and and I'll, I'll answer that and I'll, I'll go right into the Atrahasis. It's a perfect way to lead mm -hmm. in. Um, I try to go, I try to base everything on evidence. And I know it's really right. easy to find someone who's maybe doing one of these sessions where they supposedly, in some cases, I think they are real. And sometimes I think they're not maybe communicating with some being somewhere that's telling them someone, right. something. Right. And, I, and I think, right. some, again, I want to reiterate, I think some of that's real and I think some of it's fake, but the point is I don't use that as my baseline to then make decisions on when things happened. I just go by, well, what do we have for evidence that tells us? And if we don't have anything, then we, we have to just point out that we're speculating or what we're using to to determine that. And so what I use is this idea of this ancient way of, of how Mesopotamians recorded time. And that was known as a shar. Okay. Right. But so when we're looking back at the Sumerians and how, and how the Sumerians recorded time, they didn't call them years. They called them shars and and that each right. star represented a certain amount of years. Okay. So when we look at this time period, the first thing I want to point out, is that I do not in any way believe um, the doctrine we're told in school that the Sumerians developed only 6,000 years ago and that that was, no. that was where everything began 6,000 years ago. That number is very, very wrong in my opinion and it's not actually based on evidence. It's based on a predetermined number because right. what happens if you were to try to go back further than 6,000 years? You run against some issues. You run against some issues with some scientists that would say, well, then how, how could humans how could humans develop here um, in civil civilized way right after cataclysms after the last ice age? They know they couldn't do that. So that's why they waited until only about 6,000 years ago. So to give it a four to 6,000 year break so that human beings would have a more hospitable place to develop. And so it would make more sense. But really what we're finding is that the evidence, ice core data evidence, geologic evidence, Mesopotamian tablets, all the ancient stories across the world, they're all saying the same thing. And they're saying that, both a human civilizations are a lot older than we've been told and b that those who created us and influenced us are not what we not who we've been told as well and so the the best piece of evidence i have that, that i think is the sumerian king list because the sumerian king list gives us a certain amount of um rain dates for how long the kings ruled for in some of these places and when you add all those numbers up and you add up the amount of time that's gone on between them you get somewhere around between 200 and 250,000 years ago. That's how far back our story goes. Because according right. to um, the Eridu Genesis and the Sumerian King List, the two, my, the two best examples to talk about the very, very beginning, in my opinion, before human origins, that's the point I want right. to make. Right. That they clearly state that this, the city of Eridu was the first city ever created on, on Earth. And it was created, this lavish city was created. And then it talks about how all these other cities were created around Mesopotamia before the last ice age. So we're talking right. again, well over 50,000 years ago, if we can trust the numbers right. given, right. which would make a lot of logical sense because when we're looking at how old human civilizations are and how old 
and far back, the story that's echoed by all of these different things gives, this 200,000 to 250,000 year number keeps coming up. It keeps coming right. up over and over again from a lot of different sources. And so right. that I feel is the best evidence and that, I, that I think can explain where everything began. And I think that's when the Denisovian and the Neanderthal was manipulated. And that's minute. what I was just going to ask. Hold on. I want to stop yeah. right there. Cause I want people to understand that when, when, when the creator force, God, whatever you want to call it, what is, you know, created life on this planet, he created life in, you know, who knows, indiscriminate ways, energetic beings. We, like you said, were actually physical from some sort of a tweaking, a, a DNA alteration of the original, whatever, Cro-Magnon, yeah. like you said, Denisovian, Neanderthal, one of those three physical beings were then taken by again these godlike beings or a combination of all three yeah or a combination of all three right and made into what we are now which is sapien sapiens which is a further evolution or some would say de-evolution of yeah. what we eventually what we were originally designed to be but anyway continue yeah and so we um instead of again that primate perspective we have to look at what these cuneiform tablets are saying. And I'm going to read part of one right now, yeah. just to, just to point out what all this is talking about and, and how people take it. Don't take this from face value. Go, go look at what they're saying. And essentially we are these beings that were created for this planet, for the specific level of gravity that's here, the specific size of the planet. We are beings that were perfectly created well, and then we could talk about how we were manipulated later on. But initially, initially, we were a perfect creation. It, this perfect creation was, was biblically called Adam. Other names have been called Adamu. There's been and other names, too, that have, been, that have been used as well. But essentially, originally, we were created as an absolutely perfect being. And that's why this, this duality struggle with the serpent and eagle began in the first place, because... We were supposed to be this worker that was created to fulfill the role that they used to have in this physical reality. Okay. That's right. what our purpose was, except the problem was we were designed in, in such a perfect way that we were actually in, in many ways greater than them. So we, that, that old story, that fable that goes way back is that, you know, we ended up rising to become greater than our creators. And that's the whole problem right. that, that gets compounded with this is that, some of these beings became greatly divided over this because they never felt that we were supposed to be this in the first place. Right. We we're supposed to right. be this primitive worker that has low states of consciousness that, that just goes about and farms and does this thing and doesn't just works here and doesn't right. ever ask questions. Whereas like I was talking about before to fill in some gaps, if someone didn't under, some people didn't understand what I was talking about, these chakra centers that exist within us that are along our spinal cord, they represent these energetic centers where we can right. achieve higher states of vibrational frequency doing these certain tactics, you know, achieving a, a state of health in the body, achieving a, achieving a mental state, getting growing on all these different levels. And the, the, the whole thing about why that's fascinating is that that design was done in a specific way because our creator fell in love with his creation and therefore right. wanted to, to take up the ultimate challenge, which was, I think you mentioned this, ult, this, this great God, which I do think is absolutely the great prime creator of everything. I think this right. creator we call Enki or Ea wanted to try to create us in that image of perfection right. as right. a way to show that you're like a master creator. You can almost be like God. You can create something perfect. And I, th and I think that's where all this stems from this jealousy arose between them because we ended up being this perfect creation. So what happened? Well, over time, all this turmoil erupted and we ended up being genetically downgraded. Now I want to read right. a very short um, part of the atrahasis just to give Go people ahead. a little perspective so that, and this is after the creation of man, this is talking about um, when essentially things Turned, got, got a little crazy on earth and, and they decided that we were essentially um, despoiling the planet. So I want to read this, this right. is from the Atrahasis. This is one of my favorite cuneiform tablets from Mesopotamia of all time. It's one of the oldest ones. Atrahasis is of alternate name during this time period in Sumer, which was this pre-Sumer, before the flood. Right. His name was right. Zayasudra or, or um, 
Atrahasis, as it's called, and he was the last king briefly of Sharupak before everything was destroyed. Okay. Now what, so what he, this is the tablet he was recording these, these, this ancient information and, and it states, we, the great Anuna, all of us agreed together on a plan. Anu and Adad were to guard above. I, Enlil, was to guard the earth above. Where you went, Enki, you were to undo the chain and set us free. You were in charge of controlling the balance, but instead you gave wisdom and knowledge to the people. Your creations have become nu too numerous and despoiled the earth. You imposed your, you imposed your loads on man. You bestowed noise on mankind. You slaughtered a god together with his intelligence. Let us make far-sighted Enki swear an oath to the end, to create a flood on earth, to wipe away all of life. Um, so, Jay, like that, that quote is one of my favorites, because and I bring it up all the time, but this whole idea of us being their creation that was supposed to do the work for them, and that we essentially, the, the purpose of us was that they took on these certain roles so that they could undo the chain so they could be free. You know, what is that right. chain they're talking about? Uh, I, believe, I believe that it's talking about this physical reality and a mortal existence. Right. I think they conquered reality. And I think they took over certain roles within our reality so that we essentially became, um, you, I guess you could call us like this, this farm of consciousness, this farm of like animals that think that they're animals, but they're not really animals because of the, the way the paradigm right. is created here. But I, I just want to say one last thing is that um, in, in Genesis, of course, it talks, it, it's, it specifically mentions that we were created in their image. And I just want to leave it there. Right. It, it gives that reference there. So we have all of these different ref, these re references throughout history that really show us that we're not a product of just an ape, but we're actually a product of, of ancient beings. And some people say, oh, I could never believe in, in anything like that. Well, you just go look in the mirror because you're not what you think you are in some cases. Right, 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 right. So very well said. It brings a lot of questions up. And I know yeah. um, we're about a little bit, about, we're about 45 minutes into this. And I want to be fair to you because I know you. I'm going to speed it up better. Then. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, I want to be fair to you. We will get some questions at the end for those that are watching. We have a okay. great, a great number of people watching now. Between all channels, we're probably about a hundred people live. But, uh, and by the way, thanks to all of you guys. And if you are uh, watching live right now and you have not bought Matt's book off of Amazon, I don't care that you want an audio book. Buy this book and keep it and read it. And again, go back to it. And, and, and these are the type of books, honestly, where especially if you're not super, super aware, and obviously they're only a small, minute group of us on this planet, you're going to have to refer back to this book anyway. There's so much in it. I mean, I've already read it like probably three times now. And I was even looking at it today to ask questions to you. But again, back to what you just said regarding the Enuma, Elish, or the Atrahasis, excuse me. Um, same thing, different name. Um, the, the reality is, or what I want you to possibly explain even better than you already have, and you've done an amazing job so far, is, you know, why would these beings who conquered reality, who conquered the physical realm, who conquered, you know, moving into higher dimensional space, again, the Anunnaki, however you want to refer to them, why would they um, create a race of beings or why wouldn't they maybe is even a better question, create a race of beings that they didn't want to evolve. And again, obviously there were some of them that do want us to evolve, but explain that back and forth between the two brothers, which obviously is Enlil and Enki or Ia, as you refer to them. And again, there's many names for them, right? From many different cultures over time. So people get confused, but kind of explain that battle between Enki and Ia, just as you just read in the statement, it flat out says that Enki gave them wisdom, which was wrong. But explain that a little bit in more depth. Okay, well, that's essentially why the serpent became demonized. To just go backwards and sort of circle back again, is sure. he was this creator of us that made us in this image of, of them, these great Anuno that also are referred to by the Sumerians as the Anunnaki. We were created in their image. So we have, we got all of their gifts. And right. that's where all of these problems stem from because some of these beings like Enlil and others, they never felt like we deserved them in the first place because right. in, our, in our, in their eyes, some of their eyes, they still remember when we were just this primitive 
worker here, just this primitive being that they then gave sentient life. That's the whole point. Sentient means the ability to have consciousness and have awareness of the world around you. And we, we became sentient and that's where all these problems came in was because we were never supposed to be in some of their eyes. It's like we were this blemish that was created because it was, it was considered to be um, something that would be banished. That's why that some of these were referred to as fallen angels. We can get into how they talk about how human beings were then perceived as, as this lower being, but yet um, human women were still considered very attractive to some of them. And that's how we have some of these references to how the Nephilim could have been created in some of these biblical fallen right. angels and all these terms. But it, it comes down to that we are, we, we are a great being that was created in the image of, the, of these beings. And that's what this whole battle over information and creating a certain paradigm of reality would be here. And that's what it has been. We've been controlled by war and all of these materialistic and fear-based things for so long to keep us trapped in a certain mentality. Because what would happen if we weren't? Our, collectively, our entire planet would change on such a, such a fundamental level that we would break this entire paradigm and everything would change. I don't think that right. people realize how much things could be different here if things had gone a, a slightly different route than they did. We're only in this place because of certain powers that be that, uh, that pushed us in this place. And what I mean by that place is, is, is so many people, and it makes me very sad, when I, when I walk around... Um, Something like when, I, when I'm driving down the street, or I'm walking down the street and I see someone walk by me and you can clearly tell that their life isn't great. They, they look terrible. They're, they're probably just going to go home and sit next to their TV and, and they're not going right. to, they probably have nothing to smile on. They want to just die. That person is only in that mentality because their life has gone a certain direction. But more importantly, it's because they don't have this perspective to understand how amazing they are and how important they are. And so they allow right. themselves to be pulled down into this empty um, illusion of a, of a world just simply because, because they didn't achieve cer something in this, in this reality. And I think that we really are at the place where we're in this really um, huge crossroads where we're, we're changing over to a new zodiacal period this new right. period of Aquarius and I, people all around the world are waking up all the time yes. to yes. at least that we've been lied to and that there's an alternate side to our reality that we're not being told. And that's what this great division is all about. Right. And quite honestly, Matthew, um, we wouldn't even be allowed to have this conversation right now, broadcasting all across the world, pushing this information into the public space, dropping this light, pushing this light into the universe 10 years ago, you and I wouldn't even, this wouldn't even be allowed to have, we wouldn't even be at a place consciously and energetically where this conversation would even be allowed to have this. The transmission would be scrambled. Something would go wrong. I mean, I remember back in the early days when you and me and Gerald and, and Rex were doing broadcasts, we, there were a lot of times when we would say things and the transmission would block, you know? So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely a hundred percent right that we are now in a space and time um, where we're allowed, okay, universally, energetically, vibrationally, consciously to have these conversations intelligently and not be blocked. I mean, you know, you made that comment many times uh, in the book that, you know, there were these type of conversations you couldn't even have. I mean, Matthew, probably guys like you and I have been burned at the stake, <laughs> disemboweled, stretched, murdered, lit on fire, whatever, you know, many, many existences or previous lifetimes or previous incarnations because we are these people of light attempting to position this information to the majority or, you know, just to some. And thankfully, again, you wrote it very eloquently in the book. We are now in a place in time where we can have these conversations and we are not being attacked and we are not being, you know, dismissed out of hand. Sure, we're still a minority. But like you said, there are many, many people waking up to this and this conversation makes sense to many people. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, there were very few of us walking this earth, you know, with this mission that you and I now share. Um, and I feel like that's the greatest thing ever that you and I can have this conversation and we can extend these thoughts and we can position this material into the universe. Because again, you know, from a quantum perspective, this is how everything works. This is how we're going to change things. You know, it's, we've talked obviously in our past podcasts, about what is it, the 100 monkey or the 10 monkey, you know, experience, monkey. 
a hundred monkey. And, and it's, this is what we're doing right now. Yes, it is. And, and, and that's, and that's the point I want to get across. You know, people are waking up, maybe they don't have a job. They don't like things aren't going great, but just imagine you're here right now in this time period where everything is changing on such a rapid pace that we have no idea about what is going to come in our lifetimes. I mean, think, think about how much has changed just in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, again, you and I wouldn't even be able to have a conversation online. It was no. just what? The very primitive early stages of, of all this communication. And look at us now. Technology has allowed us to connect all over the world in almost a seamless way. And, and that's why I, I think people should wake up with a, you know, a little kick in their step and a little smile is that we're here during an amazing time. And that we're able to, even if you're not taking part in change, you're at least taking part to observe all these things happening. Right. To me, right. that's still a pretty amazing show to be able to sit back for, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, man. I mean, it's like I said, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a privilege. I'm humbly honored to be able to share this conversation with you, to talk about these things. Um, and like I told you, man, like you have evolved. I mean, both of us have, but you have evolved dramatically in the last just two years with your research and your work. And, and clearly all of this, there's no coincidences, right? All of this is happening as it does because it's literally the creator, God, however, again, you rephrase, you know, the, the master uh, originator of all things. This is the plan. It's all unfolding yes. as it's supposed to. Exactly. That, that's a great point is, um, if you look at how there's clearly an intelligent design behind the universe, okay, we know that, but you can see it everywhere in, in, in mathematics alone is the evidence for an intelligent creator because mathematics is like that language code in a computer that's then used to then create something like a, a game or a website or anything. It's just code. It's just certain code that, that is then created through a virtual world that then is made physical. That's the same thing that we're in. Now, if that's the case... And if this prime creator God knew that if, if free will was based completely on random chaos, right? Like we could make whatever decision we want to and none of it mattered. Everything would just destroy itself. It would be, right. um, it, it would, it would be an imploding situation. You would never have anything get anywhere because there would never be any kind of a hidden structure to it. So what is that right. hidden structure? There's this hidden structure behind reality where, we as conscious sentient beings, the, the higher we get on an awareness standpoint, the more connected we get back to this creator. It doesn't matter who you are. You can't become a higher conscious being without getting more connected to your spiritual side and this all seeing great creator that in this reality that we exist in. The, and the, and the, the way that the reason that's amazing is that that design has been done in such a certain way where even though evil can prevail at certain times, light and in like, we, like a lot of people talk about this idea of hate versus, versus love and light versus dark, the, the, intrinsic, the intrinsic design behind it because of how everything would go is that light and love and that side of energy is always going to become dominant because that's how the code was written itself. If it wasn't, right. if it wasn't done that way, we would, everything would essentially succumb to chaos and destroy itself. It just shows you that there is a hidden design behind everything. And I think that the, the way you, you see that is that everything is always going to be balanced, no matter what. If something is unbalanced for a very long time, like we've seen over thousands of years, then it means that the pendulum has to switch to the other side for equally as long. And that's an amazing concept to consider when we think that the ancient cultures talked about how the, the civilization that was here was called, they were here around during what was called the golden age. And we are now right. returning to that golden age right now. So let me ask you a question about that, because this was always the Jay and Matt back and forth in the past. Yeah. And, you know, I could make this point and I want you to answer it. Now I have, by the way, I am fully in support of the Matthew LaCroix message now. And I also know, I don't believe I know that we are already in the initial stages of the golden age and how it migrates and where it goes is kind of still yet to be determined. But yeah. the more people that become aware, the more people that become higher conscious, we resonate a frequency that will most likely lessen the impact of the dark forces as they're pushed aside. But I do have to ask you, and I'm going to bring up some evidence. We do know right now 
you know, we're going off the path a little bit. We'll get back on the path in a second. But we do know right now that 5G is literally right around the corner. Okay, we also know from my research, from my understanding, from all the things I do on a day-in, day-out basis, that they are literally desecrating, as you know, Matt, our environment with endocrine-disrupting chemicals and all kinds of other modern chemicals, blue light from technology. I mean, it could go on and on and on. Obviously, 5G is part of that. If I was to say, if I was looking around, and again, this is an opinion answer for you from you, but if I was to say that I wasn't like you, and I wasn't vibrating at where I was vibrating, I could make a very strong and cogent argument that the dark forces look to be winning because of the acceleration of technology. So I kind of want your opinion as, and again, I support your opinion, so I'm not of that side, but I'm playing devil's advocate for this interview. I want you to tell me, in your opinion, what is going to stop this massive front and center, full scale assault and acceleration into transhumanism? I want you to just kind of give me your answer as how that's going to well, stop. I guess the first point I'll make about that is when we look at something like Facebook or a lot of these other um, online tools, many would argue that they were only created as a way to monitor people, right? Whereas at the same time, some of those tools have then backfired and become an incredible platform for spreading truth. So in some ways, yeah, some way, social connection. Yep. So technology is being used for many, many bad ways, but at the same time, it's being used for many, many good ways. And I think in the end of the day, listen, there are definitely entire generations of people that have, it, it's almost like looking at some kind of a walking dead scene where people are just right. walking around, looking at their phones. They don't zombies, really zombies, zombies, some zombies. Kind of a conscious yeah. level. It's this zombie world. And yeah, that, that exists. But at the same time, all those people that would never, maybe back in the day, like you and I talking about when, when you and I would have been burned on that stake, those people would have lived in some farm town somewhere and they never would have had access to any information, no matter what. Maybe they wouldn't have been polluted by technology and been on their phone. Maybe they would have been out farming and doing something more connected. But at the same time, they're not really getting all this information being handed to them from all these different sides. So to me, the, the downfalls of technology are greatly outweighed by all the benefits that are coming out of them right now. You and I having this discussion is an exact, exact example of that. But like you said, there's a lot of things that are, coming out that are coming out right now that are very disturbing. The idea that something like 5G could have a very significant effect on our eternal systems and our conscious antenna connection, scattering us and all these other things that affect us on, on a level. I absolutely um, completely agree with that. When I Early on when I was on this path, the very beginning and learning all these things for the first time, I remember having being at home in my little sanctuary here out somewhat pretty much in nature and feeling a very high vibration, really high knowledge. I was, I, I felt really clear. And I remember initially I would go to town, I'd go into town to get something and you would immediately get surrounded by people and stuff and wireless signals. And all of a sudden that vibrational frequency clearness I had right down. And I was right back down to that lower vibrational state. And it took me a long right. time to be able to go out into public and not have my state affected by right. every, everything right. around me. It takes a very, right. very, um, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of practice to be able to hold your vibrational like that. But what does that mean for most people that don't even know about that? It oh, means that there's no chance. They're being bombarded yeah. on a daily basis no and, don't even and they don't even realize that. So in the end, Jay, Obviously, those that are, you call them the dark forces or those that are more of, of the malevolent side, they are clearly trying to stop all of this and creating all this chaos right now and creating all this division and fear, but people are largely rejecting it. And it's, it's such an amazing thing for me to be able to share something, some story or something that came out and then later find out that it's something that's being considered um, spreading around the world and, and, and those who are at the top are concerned about it or whatever. It just shows that we're at this time period where conspiracies are now and, and those, those who are looking into these alternative theories are being considered a serious threat. Well, dude, you, we might be here all night. This is so <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and I promise I won't keep you that much longer, but I have to keep you long enough to get through our talking points. But to all of that, to all of that, 
let's just talk about what's happening right now. Okay. I mean, I can talk about some of the new discoveries are being made too after go ahead. Well, we're going to, yeah, we're going to get to that Manitoba cave in Alabama in a second, but let's just talk about what you just said. Cause you said a lot. Okay. And the truth is so much is coming out into the mainstream right now that people that are of the zombie vibration. And, and by the way, let's just say this, even if you're a zombie, a sleeper, um, you know, a normie, whatever people refer to people that really have no awareness today, like you said, with the blink of an eye they can wake up tomorrow and be like boom what's going on yeah, right so we right. know that everyone everyone can awaken and anyone everyone and anyone can awaken at any time but people do awaken at their own rate and that's fine but but to you what you're saying matt so much comes out on a daily basis right now that for those who are not, quote unquote, of an awareness level that you and I are, and, and, and many of the fine people watching this right now are, can you imagine what it must be like for them to see an article or a, a link like all over yesterday with Bill Clinton in a dress, right? Like on, uh, what's his name, Epstein or whatever, it doesn't matter, but you know, on his wall. So it's like, there's so much now being revealed of like, the things that you and I just don't even care about because you could like, call it the dark underbelly of, of, the of dark underbelly is being exposed. Correct. Yeah. And it's amazing what that might actually be doing to transform, you know, in this natural evolution of the light, you know, the Aquarius rising um, in ways that you and I can't really even explain or describe. So, I mean, there's, it's all, again, it's all happening as it should and as God wants it to. And so there's like a divine uh, message or almost a divine in, uh, uh, unravelment to it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy how it's happening, but it's, it's interesting. And I want your thoughts on it, but I want, do you think that that really is the grand evolution? The grand plan is to just slowly, but surely and methodically reveal things as it's necessary so that people that are quote unquote are asleep will become attuned to it. Yeah, it's it's this idea where some of these individuals, these powerful individuals, and I mean anyone at this point who doesn't believe that they exist, needs to just simply go look at the central bank and the power behind the Rothschilds. Absolutely. I mean, it's so obvious that it's almost silly now, and it's not really hidden that much, is that the fact that there are very powerful elites that have a lot of control here, and they control everything, the media, the entire narrative and education doctrine. Everything. It's funny, right. and you bring that up. It's like, how is this stuff perceived by someone who doesn't know any of this? It's it's like you look at this and you're like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's paradigm shifting. It seems so impossible that right. it, it would be impossible to them because when you when you don't have information to look at the the strangeness of what some of these elites involved in some of these um, dark practices and some of the real sickness, this real psychological sickness that does exist. In some of them, um, we're, you mentioned um, what's going on right now with this whole Epstein thing. I just and I don't want to go into that at all in depth. I just want right. to say, it, to me, the whole thing is like, you know, when you see all of those who are a part of something that's evil and something that's like like a conspiracy, right. controlling and dark. In the end, they always end up. Um, attacking each other and then collapsing right. because there's no organization and it's all based on this certain kind of mindset. So right now you're seeing these upper echelons um, start to fall apart. How some it's of the information unraveling, right? Yeah, it's literally yeah. like a made right. It's like a made-for-TV movie. Yes. that's unraveling as it goes. It's exactly. Awesome. It's like something right out of some kind of a movie. It's so weird, right? And look, look what we have here. Here we have this high-profile character named Epstein. Right who just happened right. to be the liaison connection to all of these elites and this, to everybody. And this right. underground network of both pedophile and, and I don't, and this is a really dark area. I don't want to go deep in it, but yeah. the point is <laughs> the underground <laughs> network between all these elites. And, and right yes. now the entire thing is collapsing because Literally. all this, all these things are being exposed because they're all fight in fighting right now. And the point is all that stuff is really evil and dark and it's being cleansed on its own through information it being is. shared by technology today. Right. Let me ask you a question about that, and then we go back to the cave sure. in Alabama, which is fascinating. Yep. 
because we just got a really good question from those in the, who are watching. It's from Maureen Sutton, and she said, I want Matt and Jay to answer, are these elites, these stage characters that we're all being exposed to that are quote-unquote unraveling, are they even human? You answer first, and then I'll give my question, my answer. They're human beings who I feel have been taken over in many ways on a conscious level. It's like they're just a shell for another type of being or entity. And I know that seems completely insane to some people. To Not here, that. Matt, because we talk about that. We, but remember, remember what I said. We're just like an antenna for consciousness. Exactly. Antennas right. can pick up different signals. And that's the point I want to make is that these elites and these kings throughout history, they all did this one thing. It's called selling your soul. It's when they have some kind of an interaction, meeting, vision, whatever you want to call it, dark ritual, and they get into contact with something that's a dark entity. And that, whatever it is, some being, which is why they worship all that strange stuff of Bohemian Grove and all that stuff. But when they do get in contact with that, they sell their soul for power and wealth and all this, right. all this fame. Absolutely. But they become like a shell of energy where they no longer have a higher vibrational state. And that's why so many of them just look like they're sort of walking skeletons with no life left in them. So that's, that's so, how I feel is that the elites are like emissaries for keeping this control system and this paradigm here in place so that so that things don't get out of control and we and we all awaken and realize this form of conformity and control and uh, illusion that we're living in that was so brilliantly said so i actually my answer is i agree 1000 million percent but i gotta ask you further decode it because again this is amazing so these beings that are inhabiting these meat suits like you said through antenna through chakra vibrational frequencies whatever are they Demonic? Are they archons, meaning they're just spiritual entities from the astral realm, or are they, and again, I know I'm asking you to go out on a limb here, but you're the guy to do it. Um, are they something else, meaning are they of this reptilian ilk or lineage, which are almost like higher, lower density, but higher age, and ain't more ancient with more technology and more um, understandings because of their age. What do you okay. think they really I think are? To two, dial it? two things are going on there. One, especially, especially if you look into some of the Egyptian knowledge and some of the stuff that Thoth talks about with Atlantis is that they right. he specifically states that the people of Atlantis, the men of Atlantis delved into black magic and rituals and where they actually um, connected to like these other portals and these, un these other dimensions. And they, he talks about how those, those are like gateways that are guarded by great masters. And if those gateways are open, great evil can be let in. And that right. those entities and beings, we have very little information about. Right. We just know right. that, that Thoth says clearly that there is chaos and evil beyond what we could ever imagine in other realms. And that, like, again, some of these great masters have been, the whole purpose of them being here was to actually protect and, and to control these the guard. Here. Now, right. now, on the other side, the, uh, the Anunnaki or the Anuna, as they call themselves, I think they, they are also interdimensional, higher dimensional beings. So they are right. able to right. move between different dimensions and exist right. beyond our time, our perception of time and space. Therefore... When you're talking about entities that, go, that are beyond the third dimension, you could be talking about a whole host of, of beings that exist out there. But specifically when you're mentioning archons, the word archon means ruler. And when you read the Gnostic right. Nag Hammadi scriptures, which was found in a cave along the Nile River in 1945, it states right. in there that they even call them the rulers of our reality, specifically talking about the Anuna because they took on certain roles within our reality. Now, so I think there's two things going on here. Some of these beings that are controlling some of these individuals may be a combination of some of these more malevolent Anunnaki, Anuna beings, but they also might be some of these others that have been opened up from portals. We don't fully know. We just know that when you open up, when you use things like some of this ancient, what they, what they really called magic and understanding this white and black magic and, and it's, there's different right. things you can do with it. Um, there are many, many outcomes that, that can be had. And we've seen that throughout history with 
all the rise and fall of civilizations, I think. Okay, so let's get back to the thing because that was awesome. And I agree, again, with you. There, It's very difficult to define the hierarchy of dark and light. You know, I always, you know, obviously our, you know, our good, amazing decoding friend, David Icke, has decoded reptilians. He's decoded reptilian beings who energetically can morph, you know, as he calls them, shapeshift. And really, maybe they're not shapeshifting. Maybe they just bend the spectrum of light to appear human. Maybe they have great technology to appear human. We don't know. There's been a lot of books, right, um, that have been written in the last 20 years, oftentimes classified as conspiratorial. But now, as more and more stuff comes to light, like you said, talking about Epstein and the whole uh, conspiratorial, uh, you know, dark dungeon of the elites and all the things they do. There's a lot of people that have said that they have seen, you know, these politicos, these important influential quote unquote rulers of this planet shapeshift into <laughs> giant reptilian beings. So who knows, Matt, maybe these beings can appear in many shapes and sizes again, because of the way they can bend light and because the way they can actually, as you said, from their uh, dimensional presence, jump in and out, right? I always go back to that movie, um, what was it called, uh, with Denzel Washington, I think it was called Fallen, right, where there was like a being, he kept jumping in from pe person to person, he'd be in a parking lot or in a crowd in the city and he could jump into one being, I forget the name of the movie, but anybody who's watching, you can write it in and stuff like that, but you're right, they have powers dimensionally that we don't really comprehend or understand, so anyway, awesome Let's talk about Manitou Cave, which was a, discovered just this year, right, in Alabama in April, and talk about, you know, what was discovered there and how it refer references, like, really probably the original builders and architectures uh, or architects of us. Talk about that. Yeah. So this is going to be a little bit of a, a, um, a diversion of what we're just talking about, but it directly connects into it as well. Um, I, I love when we come across – a new piece of evidence that then fits, fits like a key in a lock with something else from somewhere else across the world. And you take all of these together and it weaves together the story of history. And, and one of those has, is a new discovery that's been recently made. And I wanted to bring it up because I wanted to bring up new things that come up because it's important for us to incorporate all of these things. So a new discovery was made in, in this past April of this year. And what they found is that um, as many, as many know, uh, the United States and South America had, uh, and Mesoamerica had ancient cultures, um, ancient indigenous cultures that were influenced long ago by these serpent um, knowledge bringers, and they built all these incredible temples and structures after that. But one of the things that is now really coming to light is the significance that the United States has played in that. Looking at places like the Serpent Mound out in the Midwest and all these other um, serpent mounds with these huge skeletons have been found and these um, temples and these, all these things that have been, are now being uncovered. This new piece of evidence that we're finding is just expanding this picture more of these influences. And what they found is in Alabama, um, along the famous Trail of Tears, there was a, a cave they, they found called Manitoba Cave. And inside that cave, um, they found this ancient writing that they'd never translated before. So to give a couple of some stats, this is like, it's a really phenom phenomenal story that's developing that, of course, only a few people know about because it was buried by the mainstream. But near Fort Payne, Alabama, if people want to do some research, there's a cave called Manitoba Cave that's had tourists for for long, long periods of time, but there's these sections of cave that people can never get to because they're so difficult to get through. And that's where these discoveries were made. So this cave is a mile long, okay? And it has a stream running through it. In the very back of the cave, in this very remote section that's difficult to get to, researchers found 10 feet up on this, this vertical wall on the ceiling, they found all this ancient Cherokee writing, okay? People might say, well, like, what did Cherokee, what does that have to do with anything? Well, the Cherokee link back to all these other indigenous cultures of the United States, like the Hopi and Pueblo, connected all the way back to well, the ancient Anasazi, getting all the way back to the influences long ago of those indigenous cultures and who influenced them long ago. That's where all of this comes in, because we find some new evidence that, that sheds light on that. So... Um, and when asked how those inscriptions could have been written up 10 feet up on a sheer wall all the way back uh, in, in the day when it was done, they asked one of these Cherokee elders, and this is how the Cherokee elder replied. I found this to be fascinating. He said, he says, a long time ago, 
people could do things that people cannot today. These people would have, had extremely, would have been extremely powerful and able to perform seemingly impossible feats such as flying. And it mentions how there was two different stories essentially published for this, okay? I, I wanted, I'm just kind of doing a little backfilling to the story. Two versions were published. One was a mainstream version and one was the secondary version of the article. The first version that was published through the Alabama News stated that there was um, these translations discovered, but they weren't, um, they weren't actually translated and they're still being reviewed. Whereas Cambridge University version completely contradicts what they said and said that, yes, it was translated. And it goes on to talk about how the Cherokee in this translation, these ancient elders, these shaman used to talk to what they called the old ones. And, and this is what the writing talks about. It said that these Cherokee elders, one of the elders was chosen. He was called the goose. And the goose's role was to go deep into this cave a mile in and to communicate with these beings that they called the old ones, who they said were, were around long before the, Cher the Cherokee were and were non-physical spiritual beings that they said provided great wisdom to them. And so in this, this new translation, the, the Cherokee elder um, is reading this conversation it's having with these beings. And, it, and it, one of the most fascinating things about it is that the writing itself is written completely backwards to not face the reader, but to actually face the cave. Because according to these elders, they state that these entrances were portals into other dimensions, these spiritual dimensions where they could communicate with these beings. Now, what's the point of that whole story? Well, all these other cultures around the world they refer to these ancient beings just like the Cherokee did. When the Cherokee called them the old ones, we find other cultures that call them the ancient ones. And in, and in other places, there's other names used as well. But the point is, instead of thinking as human civilizations as being this progressive thing where they learn everything as they go along based on their, in, um, their, their learning valuable lessons, it's more or less all these civilizations that have, been, that have come up, risen and, and and then disappeared over time have largely been these influenced civilizations that have been created. And so the Cherokee talk about these old ones that were likely the ones that probably jump started and created their civilization and gave them the knowledge at the very beginning. So just like what we've lost over time is that these individuals, these mystics, these elders would be the ones that would be in communication with these, with these beings for knowledge. And over time, all that was lost. And that's why, we're in this world now that's so scattered and disconnected from this old world and this old paradigm that we used to have. So who do you think they were there? And by the way, so it's 6.03 right now, guys. And I literally was just told that I have to pick up my daughter in 30 minutes. So we have 30 minutes to okay. continue. Let's, let's let's so we have plenty, plenty of time to knock out the rest that's on the thing. But okay. what do you think? So these elder beings, these ancient ones, you know, we have the movie, right? Dr. Strange, the ancient one, right? So, these beings, these mystical, magical, you know, whatever they were, possessors and keepers of the sacred flame, the sacred fire, whatever you want to call it, were they humanoid, man? Or were they energetic beings that just were here who were around when humans came to be? I think we are them. And that's the whole point I want to get across is that we are not this ape we are them we are created in their image so they are essentially just a, a much taller more intelligent ancient version of us um and we're we're designed specifically for this planet that's why we're at the height we are we are a design based on certain um laws and principles so the old ones that they're referring to i think if you connect it all around the world to all the cultures they're simply talking about these ancient architect creators and, and designers of our civilizations that the Mesopotamians refer to as, as the Anunnaki, and they call themselves the Anuna, children of light, actually, in, in some other places, too. And some of them don't even call us the children of light. They actually call us the children of mankind. Right. Like, like, we're not even fit for as mankind. We're still just children, whereas they are literally like the beings of light. Right. Right. I mean, that's, that's very, very well, very well said and very easy to code it. For me, I just every now and then get a little bit, I'd say, confused over the timelines. But then when I remove my three-dimensional human hat and put on my higher dimensional human hat, I realize that there's no reason to get caught up in this time because you're right. Time doesn't truly exist, but here in this three-dimensional encoding that we're existing in right now. And who's to say 
that as we move into this quote unquote age of light, that everything that we hold dear changes and that time even goes away. And we don't have these rules that we've all been brainwashed and conditioned to follow, you know, through technology and enslavement and enslavement and entrainment from televisions and from radio. And now obviously their big tool is technology. And, and, you know, it's my opinion, Matt, that to move into the golden age, we will have to go back to nature. We will have to unplug from all of this. We will be living in communal farms or, or, or uh, communities where everybody is interreliant upon everybody else. And we won't have money and currency. It'll be like some sort of form of Ubuntu or barter where everybody performs a service because as you said earlier, everybody has amazing, unique, creative talents. It's just a matter of exploring and finding them out and of course, utilizing them and as you know in the money magic system most people never are able to bring those things out or to channel that energy or to literally find out what it is that makes them so great and sovereign because they're they gotta pay their bills man yeah they, they, they gotta get into into the game and chalk clock in and clock out every day and so so many people never ever understand or find what it makes them this like you said this magnificent creator because all of us have that ability but so few of us tap into it so maybe that's where we're going yeah it, it is I, it very well said jay it is it's where we're returning to the source we're returning to what we are which is this incredibly divine light being who's not meant to just simply you know, wander around here and, and, be, and be controlled through fear and war and materialism and the magic money system and using up all of our energy and time until we're old and then we finally have a few years before we die. What kind of life is that for, for an incredible, higher, highly conscious being that, you know, is born from the stars? We are made to do a lot more than we are now. And I think people in the future will realize that. And I think that's why we're seeing so many people that are just unsettled. They just, they can't, they don't know what's wrong. They just can't take this, what's going on anymore in their life. They can't do the same thing every day over and over again. And I think that's why you're seeing so many things shifting and moving and changing is that there's this collective, um, there's this uh, collective stirring in society where I think we're being activated on a, on a subatomic level a conscious level, even if we don't realize it yet, it's we're being drawn towards a higher state of consciousness. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, I, I mean, I, I honestly don't really know how you, to, to, to put it better than what you in the way you just talked. But let's talk about the last three bullet points we have just to make sure that we cover everything. We need so, to leave time for questions too. We're gonna have to be quick. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, and we really we've covered a lot of this already. So. Yeah, yeah, we jumped we jumped around a little bit too. Yeah. So you know, from an ancient civilization standpoint, I do want you to talk a little bit about. And obviously I can add my personal firsthand experience of just being in the sacred Valley, but you know, ley lines, the harmonic yeah. structures, the way these things were built. And let me just say this, cause I haven't shared this with you. I did share this with Brax. Uh, and I've also had another podcast I did with uh, Dr. Dave Murphy, who's an amazing shamanic healer, ambient shaman. We talked about this, but, um, and you kind of already hit this, but when you go into the churches, okay. In, South America, obviously, specifically in Peru and Bolivia, they, you know, they built these things, the conquistadors, as you and Gerald, you know, and Billy Carson have covered, you know, very well when you guys did that series, you know, a couple of years back. Um, they built their churches over top of the spiritual buildings and temples of the Mesoamerican cultures, right? The Inca, yeah. the Tiwanaku. The um, Aztec. Yeah, the Aztec, right. You know, the Mayan, all of them. And the one thing that blew me away, Matt, when I walked into these temples, you know, churches, whatever you want to call them, and they're really a combination of both, there were always giant doors. Doors literally 20 feet tall. And doors that were ornately designed with insane architectural and inscriptions and jewels and just whoever built them, it was not the indigenous because the indigenous are five, 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 seven. You know, they said the Incas were way taller because they were obviously probably a product of, you know, the elder things or elder beings, you know, manipulating them again, Thoth being a giant, tall, uh, fair skinned teacher of wisdom and bringer of wisdom. So who knows, but it's crazy to look at that. And then to not being an aware being, 
consciously see some form of humanoid being, maybe a giant angelic being. And I, you know, I shared that with Rex that when I closed my eyes and I focused really hard after seeing, like I was in the fifth church and they all, Matt had the same things. They're all 20 foot doors. Yeah. Again, ornately designed and crazy. And I, when I focused really, really hard, I truly did see what I would be, you know, hard pressed to not say, and again, obviously I'm not a, a disciple of the Abrahamic religions, but as you know, the, the Bible has baptized men and women into believing that there were giant archangels in battle gear with wings. And that's what I saw. And I, and I don't want people to think I'm crazy, but that's truly what I envisioned coming through those doors. And so who's to say that there weren't giant humanoid beings. And again, we know there were giant humanoids, but if you look at the timeline, they tell you that these churches, again, they tell you in the 15th and 16th and 17th century, who knows when they were really built, Matt. And if that is the case, and we believe that timeline, then who was coming through those doors? That's a good point. Um, when, yeah, when we look back at ancient history, look at the um, time periods of these pre-Diluvian kings that ruled, we have images, look at um, Gilgamesh. We right. have images of Gilgamesh where he's shown um, with this full-grown lion sitting on his lap, and it looks like a house cat. And at the same time, we have cylinder seals from Mesopotamia that show some of these great god beings with, like a, again, like a lion that is like the size of a house cat. What's going on here? Well, I do think that these great Anuna, I do think that they're much taller than we are. Right. And they came here from somewhere else. Then that's the only reason why they're that tall. And when we think of as the Nephilim and this whole idea of right. these fallen angels and people, I think the idea is that there was this crossbred slash DNA right. manipulation that was done and whatever, however you want to look at it, some of these bloodlines in this DNA that used to exist back then, we were much taller. Right. We lived a lot longer than we do right. now and we were smarter. And over time, probably through the combination of some genetic tampering and some, and some other means as well, over time we lost a lot of that and now we're these much shorter, uh, a little bit less intelligent, but a lot of potential um, right. beings that are here. Um, and so, yes, I absolutely agree. So we're getting back to these doors. Like, who are these doors for? They're these right. doors that are like carved into sheer rock, right? How could something come through rock? Well, remember the story of the Cherokee in Manitou right. Cave. Who was that elder speaking to with writing? He was talking to the rock. He was talking to deep underground in this cliff, just like these cliffs where these doors are created into. What is going on? Well, I think that has to do with these ancient portal gateways that used right. to exist long Absolutely. ago, that Absolutely. no longer exist anymore. And we're looking at it like it's just this empty rock area but maybe once long ago, those doorways are what these gods were literally like coming through. Maybe those doorways, they could pass through and come into our realm or something. We have lost all these ancient secrets, which would again lead really well into just briefly touching on ancient civilizations and how it seemed like their entire obsession was creating these massive megalithic temples that had this certain harmonic frequency with these doorways to connect to these great beings. They would put forth the most amount of effort of anything. It wasn't them amassing great wealth as their civilization or having all this material greed. No, they spent all of their energy and time accumulating knowledge and finding balance and then creating these massive temples. To the, which I believe were created for energy, but also to potentially maybe communicate with these great wisdom bringer beings. And I think that's how we've lost this connection over time is because a lot of those great shaman and elders and died, died out and the disasters occurred here, as well as I think many of these beings may have left what we perceive as, as our time, this time here. Yeah, no, no, I, and I agree with you 100%, and, I, and I've been very vocal about this. So since returning from Peru, uh, my mission has changed. But I felt those energetic portals slash barriers, um, you know, timelines, whatever you want to rephrase them, when I, when I was in the Sacred Valley. My soul was so uplifted. I felt the energy there. And obviously, many people who go there who are of a vibrational frequency necessary to feel that are completely changed. In fact... You know, Dr. Dave Murphy, who I did a podcast earlier with today, and I've now had on 
one time on my show, and many of you guys will find out who this man is. He is absolutely unbelievable. He's 67 years old. He's a shaman. He's an Andy. He was trained by um, Juan Carlos, the famous Andean shaman. He's an amazing human being, and he's a white dude, you know, from uh, Virginia, and who's now an academic. He's a naturopathic doctor, truly an eclectic Benjamin Franklin type, and his story today about all of that and how you ha have to be at a vibrational frequency when you're in that sacred valley of Peru and then also into Bolivia to feel what I felt. And, 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 you know, his story, just a quick aside is he doesn't, he had no idea who I was. He's again, a naturopathic doctor and he did read my original book, but he didn't put two and two together that that was me, which again, you know, small world, no coincidences, but he was on YouTube and here's goes back to what you said, Matt, about like, even though there's a lot of dark aspects of technology, he was on YouTube. And he was on his channel, which is the Eclectic Shaman. And it said, you might like, and it was Rex's broadcast of me in Peru. And so he clicked on it and he said, Jay, I started listening to you. And I have never in my entire life, and I'm 67 years old, ever heard a white American speak so highly about Peru and the energy that he felt. And I was like, I got to connect with this guy. So Again, the energies right now of the earth are moving people of our spiritual awareness, our vibration, our vibratory rate um, together, and we're connecting. And again, of course, as soon as I got back, I reached out to you. I said, man, I read your book. It's incredible. We've got to talk about this. We've got to push this out. Yeah. More people need to hear this. But, but anyway, it, it really is true. Um, the, the, the ancients knew all of this stuff, and as I learned from the shaman – which is a different guy, my indigenous guide from Puno, when I was on Lake Titicaca, um, he said to me, Jay, this is exact words to me, and I'm paraphrasing it, but he said to me, and I spent two days with him, he said, Jay, you are the bridge from my culture to the modern world. Please go and show your light. That's what he said to me. And again, amazing guy. His name is Abel Ramirez. He goes by Abel. But it was just so amazing. And he, they know, those people know, Matthew, they know that the light is coming back. He was very clear to me to let me know about that. And it's like, this guy has no connection to technology. I asked him for his, I, I was very connected to him. I asked him for his email. I wanted to stay in touch. He laughed in my face. Email? Technology? <laughs> right? But he's smart. And, and he's totally aware. And it was just so touching and so moving for me to spend time with him. He did a ceremony with us on Lake Titicaca. And all of us, my wife, myself, my sales director and his wife, we were all crying. We were all in tears. We literally heard Lake Titicaca speak to us in the ceremony that he did. And it was just so unbelievable. But anyway, I'm saying that because I really do believe and not believe. It's a knowing. It's just a matter of timing. It's all coming back, Matt. And you were the first guy to really tell me that four years ago. So props to you, man. What's going on right now with this human collective while we're all reaching this higher state of vibrational frequency? You can't argue that that's just what's happening right now and i think that has to do with our position in the, the milky way it has to do with our position in relative to the sun changes and all these different factors that are going into that are coming into play but what if as this vibrational frequency of human consciousness raises right now on the earth that it actually affects the entire earth itself and some of these ancient sites that have been tuned to this higher energy and consciousness they're like ringing like a bell now Right. They're all starting to call back all of those who are reaching this other, this higher state of consciousness because it's like that time is returning again, and those ancient sites are coming alive. And I do, I believe that those all, all those ancient sites were were built long ago by these lost civilizations that were influenced by these these great wisdom bringers and beings at different times that have influences influenced them in in good ways at some times and at bad ways in others. But right now we're returning to this great golden age and and it, this is a, a an incredible time to be able to um teach others and, and witness this great paradigm shifting right now right right jay let's and let's bring some of those great questions from those people that are part of that yeah, absolutely any other po po uh, points you want to cover or are we good to answer questions right now uh, i think we we jumped around and we covered most of it um yeah let's jump into a couple questions because i think you have to go in like 10 minutes right um actually i don't so we have more time now so if there's anything else uh, monica just texted me and she said she's got it so well, I guess I'll just say on the, on the last bullet point, um, yeah. all of this stuff, ex people are saying, well, if what you're saying is true, fine. Like, I'm okay. I've never heard this. This is, this is new for me. All this stuff, it seems very overwhelming. Well, where is it? 
Well, a lot of this information, because of how controlled the media has become through a lot of these means, is that a lot of this information and this knowledge is very suppressed. You're not going to hear about cuneiform tablets really in school. You're not going to hear about any of these, these ancient civilization technology and higher consciousness. You're not going to hear about it. And the fact that you don't hear about it tells you that there is a very tight control still on this information. The fact that they can find new discoveries in Egypt and, and then two weeks later, no one ever hears about them ever again shows you that there is a very organized control over certain pieces of information. And that paradigm is rapidly shifting as individuals like you and I do shows like this to present that evidence in those ancient texts so that people can sit down and see it for themselves and have that spark needed to go have, make them find a new path in life and teach others, right? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, 100% absolutely. Okay, you ready to take some questions? Sure, absolutely. Um, where, in your opinion, are the best ancient sites in the United States to visit? Um, well, so if you're trying to go for the oldest, uh, it's really hard to, to, to beat the Southwest. Um, yeah. I would, Chaco Canyon is amazing. I haven't been to it yet, but I've done a lot of research on it. And again, the Serpent Mound and the, the whole Ohio Valley area and looking at some of these, um, they're basically like um, earth pyramids. Um, yeah. It's a little bit different, but you can see that same structure down in Mexico. And as you go further and further south, it turns more into sophisticated stone building. But the point is all that stuff came from the same legacies. Right, absolutely. That's, that's what's amazing about it, right? Yeah, the Dragon Kings. Yeah, you know? exactly, yeah. Um, so I've been, I've been all those places. I've been to the Serpent Mount. I, I wanna say the Serpent Mount is really mind blowing. Because when I went there in 2016 and I went with my wife and I went with uh, Tony Monacone from the Dakotas of Truth, um, and we were so blown away by the energy. But here's the funny thing about the Serpent Mound is getting there is really weird because you got to take some like side streets through like very rural southwestern Ohio <laughs> and you see crazy architecture like Pentecostal churches and just weird stuff that surrounds the Great Serpent Mound. And then all of a sudden you get into the Serpent Mound and they have a, a museum at the very beginning of um, the site. And you're not really ready for what you see, but man, the Serpent Mound. I think it would be a lot better to see the Serpent Mound from a helicopter versus being kind oh, of yeah. on the ground. Oh, but it's clearly not made for perspective from the ground level. So this is what we know about the Serpent Mound. And I found out absolutely, by the way, but this is what I found out. And very few people know this. It literally is built by a, what they, again, what they, what they say is a giant meteor crater. So there's a giant impact crater right in front of where all of this insane, you know, whatever was built there in the grass and in the mounds and in the dirt, the earth of the, of the earth. And again, they think it's 40 to 50,000 years old. Who knows how far back it goes? Very important. If you do go to, um, to Mexico and you see Chichen Itza, or, you know, you go to uh, the main city and you see the temples over there, which are absolutely also amazing. And the names escape me right now. Make sure you do get a chance to swim in the cenotes. The cenotes will literally upgrade your molecular structure. They literally are so advanced spiritually. There's so much sacred nature of the cenotes that when you swim in the cenotes, you're high, literally vibratorily high for up to 36 hours after. Like, I remember the first time I did it, Matthew, we couldn't sleep. Monica and I were literally staring at the ceiling. <laughs> you know, like, what the hell happened to us? I mean, it's unbelievable. They're like portals to the underworld. It's it's like a gateway to this, you know, higher vibrational. Uh, you're literally in the water floating in it, yeah. and you're like, what is going on? The water is so pristine yeah they're well because they're deep deep underground aquifer water so it's like this purity of of energy um and i've swam in them before and they're they're pretty amazing i think people would be surprised how cold they are too it's an amazing time to be alive you know let's end this though before that let's just you give you some of your strategies that people of a conscious mind and a like mind and a, and a vibration of love right because we're all attempting to get to the 500 level on the David Hawkins scale, which is love, right? That's where we're going to move to planetary consciousness. What will you give people right now watching this on a daily basis? What should they be doing like when they wake up in the morning to when they go to bed at night to, again, elevate their vibration, which is all that matters? Start in baby steps. Don't try to take things on too, 
it too much at once. You'll, you'll probably end up quitting and just reverting back to your old self. Take everything in small stages. Say, today I'm going to take a walk in nature and appreciate it. Or tomorrow I'm going to go for a nice run. Or tomorrow I'm going to read a book or a new, a new chapter. Just take everything in base, baby steps and always remember one thing. Everything comes down to if you are being, um, if you are understanding the level of awareness that you have. When you say to yourself, well, what did I do today? Did, did what I do today benefit others? Did it benefit me? Was it, was it a, a potential growth factor? Was it something that I hurt someone else? When you're aware of your actions and what you're doing, when you take that stance to then become aware of everything you're doing and how it's affecting others around you and who you are and, and everything that in this vast universe that we exist in, when you realize it from this holistic perspective and you take yourself out from all these ways that keep us conformed and living in this fear-based system, just make sure you exist in that place where you, you realize that we're here to grow and learn and, and enjoy ourselves. So if you're not doing that, then go find that. But that doesn't mean you can't, you, you, you can't play the game. You have to still play the game here because that's, that's the whole point of this. But rise above and, and be who you want to be and, and learn the secrets that have been forbidden for so long because we're at that, that little window right now where anything is possible. Don't ever be held back by the limitations that you might perceive for yourself. Matt, all I can say is namaste. That was absolutely amazing. It's truly a gift that we reunited for this. Absolutely. Your book is fantastic. Yeah, your book is fantastic. Everyone who's watching this again, when you, you know, and you know, many people will watch this after the fact. Please buy Matt's book. You know, play the game. As Matt said, we all are playing the game, but you know, play the game peacefully, lovingly, co-creatively, and realize that we are manifesting a better tomorrow, and it's happening literally second by second. You know, now and, and right and, now. <laughs> right now, I was just going to say, like, it's so important to live in the now, right? Like, who cares what happened yesterday or what might happen tomorrow? What matters is what you do with the moment that you're in right now. And that's all that matters. So, again, Matt, I love you, brother. 